to something. He is up to something. God is doing something. Say it right now. He is up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something. Yeah. Right now. I open my eyes, it's the same voice on the inside, already so heavy, weighing on my soul, all the fear, all the worry, all the heartache, all the hurting, colliding with your lighting, trying to steal my hope, some days I break, I lose my way, more doubt than faith, but every time I'm in the fight, your love can Won't give up on me. It's a fountain flowing so deep. You're so patient and so gracious. It's unconditional. Even when I try to go my own way, even when my heart is in the wrong place, you bring it back around like a boomerang, just like a boomerang. Just every time I'm in the fight, your love keeps pulling me back, pulling me back. It's magnetic.
Good morning. Hey, it's great to see you here this morning. I uh, just want to let you know a couple things. If you are newer to Grace, we just encourage you to fill out one of those connection cards. Drop that off at our connections booth. Uh, we have a gift for you. I uh, want to make sure to invite you down to the fellowship hall after the service for coffee and cookies. Uh, always a great time to visit over some caffeine and sugar. So, uh, And also want to be able to tell you that uh, we heard from our mission team, our youth mission team. So they arrived safely, uh, made it through customs and immigration, uh, made it to the hotel, had lunch. So I got a text and I said, okay, you got to tell me, what are you having for lunch? And my daughter Aubrey said, Little Caesars. I'm like, what? So... Uh, they were able to just integrate real well into Nicaragua and, and then had a traditional dinner. But they are doing well. They're excited. Uh, they've met up with the other mission team out of California. And uh, I think those teams, sounds like they're going to just gel uh, really well. So uh, continue to pray for them. They'll be back on Saturday and have a, um, uh, have a busy full week ahead of them. So uh, anyways, welcome. And let's check out the rest of our news for this week. Good morning. So uh, let me let me see if I remember exactly where we're at with uh, our news for this morning. Um, update for VBS. Uh, VBS was a success. Had uh, just right at 115 kids. Uh, their goal was to raise a thousand dollars to go towards. Um, now I can't remember the organization. One one child is that what I somebody said. Okay, one child, and so they are working towards uh, looking at um, uh, helping with uh, foster care, and uh, in between what came in for uh, VBS and then what you donated back in the cactus and the foyer, it was over $1,100, so awesome, uh, awesome to see that come in. Uh, we have coming up um, at the August 12th we have a church yard sale coming up. So uh, we have one of our grace groups, uh, Joe Chapman's grace group, has decided that they wanted to organize that, um, and then all the proceeds will go towards the building fund. So we will be putting information out and getting a schedule out to you through the church email. August 8th through the 11th, uh, you're going to be able to start dropping things off. And so kind of go through your things, and if you have some stuff that would sell, um, if you don't think it'll sell, then just keep it. Um, but if you think it'll sell, go ahead and bring it, and then that way, uh, that'll be a great opportunity to help support the, uh, support the building fund. And then uh, the last thing, our one community service has been rescheduled, so that'll be taking place on Sunday, August 7th. Uh, there will be no services here that Sunday. Uh, we will offer children's uh, program during the 11 o'clock hour, so if um, you have children and want to drop them off for the children's program at 11 o'clock, you can do that and then head over to the, uh, head over to the high school on the stadium to uh, participate in a community service with, uh, with the area churches. So that is your grace news for the week. Brian. Thank you, Wes. Let's rise to our feet and we're going to sing here now today. Is everybody doing okay this morning so far? Huh, is everybody alive and awake and ready to sing and worship here? All right, here we go. I'm trading my sorrow. Here we go. Let's sing it out. Well, I'm trading my sorrow.
all things. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that? And you made all things work together for my good. And you made all things work together for my good. You stay the same, Lord. Amen. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night. love never fails your love never fails your love never fails fail. amen dear lord father we thank you for this time Keep our hearts open, Lord. May your spirit dwell amongst us this morning. We thank you for all that you do for us, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Uh, we are going to be in uh, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. If you want to go ahead and turn there and hold your spot, and then we'll, we'll come back to it. Uh, but I want to ask you a question. Um, have you ever seen something that was revealed, and you were like, oh, that's how that works. Or maybe I never knew that before. That's, that's fascinating. We, we kind of get a, a peek behind the curtain. Um, you saw that this morning, a peek behind the curtain when technology doesn't work. What do we do? Well, we punt, right? We figure it out. Uh, a peek behind the curtain. There's a, a TV show that's called Made in a Day. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, I think it's produced by National Geographic, um, but it gives insight into everyday objects and, and how they come to be. So uh, they, they look at like airplane meals. How do, they, how do they put all that together and so they're ready to go on the planes? How do they make electric cars? What are all the details? How do they make electric guitars and, and all of that? And so you see the behind the scenes thing, the behind the curtain of how things are made. And, and when we see those, we think, well, that's fascinating. I never knew that before. Well, these types of revelations can help us see that there's sometimes there's more than, than what we notice at first glance, and, and we get that peek behind the curtain. And really, today, that's what we're going to see in our text, is we're going to see a little bit of a, a peek behind the curtain of what's going on in Scripture and some stories that we're familiar with but we're going to see them from a little bit different perspective. And my hope and my prayer as we go through the passage today um, that we're going to really be able to grab on to this bottom line, and that is that God is faithful to keep His promises and to protect His people. God is faithful to keep His promises and protect His people. So if you would, uh, if you're not already there, Revelation 12, and in honor of God's Word, if you would stand as we read this morning. Revelation chapter 12, written by John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in labor and agony as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. There was a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. On its heads were seven crowns. Its tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and hurled them to the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she did give birth, it might devour her child. She gave birth to a son, a male, who is going to rule all nations with an iron rod. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God to be nourished there for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. 
The dragon and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail. And there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come. Because the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown down. They conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they did not love their lives to the point of death. Therefore rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has come down to you with great fury because he knows his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he persecuted the woman who had given birth to the male child. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she could fly from the serpent's presence to her place in the wilderness where she was nourished for a time, times, and half a time. From his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river flowing after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth helped the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river that the dragon had spewed from his mouth. So the dragon was furious with the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commands of God and hold firmly to the testimony about Jesus. Well, let's pray, and then we're going to dive in and kind of unpack this and, and really look at what it means for us today and how do we understand what we just read. So let's, let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your love for us. We're thankful that uh, you are faithful, that you keep your promises, that you provide protection. Lord, I pray that as we go through these, uh, these few verses Uh, Lord, that um, you would help us to see uh, what it is you want us to take out of that. Lord, help us to see a picture of your great love and your care. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, the very first thing that we see as we look at Uh, chapter 12, is we see that salvation has come. Salvation has come in verses 1 through 6. Um, You could almost title this part of the uh, 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 verses 1 through 6 as an apocalyptic Christmas story. And and we're going to kind of talk about how we can see it that way. But this first section really gives us an introduction of what will be continually unpacked throughout the rest of the chapter. Um, it begins to open the curtain so we get our first peek at to see what is going on behind the scenes. As a side note, just as we look at this chapter, there are several ways, many different views, perspectives, interpretations of Revelation. And my goal today is not to try and convince you in one interpretation over the next. However, based on my study and how I've looked at this, that my opinion will come out. Um, If you don't agree with it, okay, no problem. My goal is really just to focus on the bigger picture of what is happening in this text, a bigger picture of what's going on in the story, uh, help us to see how this fits in the overall narrative of Scripture. So the details that we might disagree on or question a little bit, um, they, shouldn't get, they should not get in the way of our understanding of what is the bigger picture and the bigger story of Scripture. As, as Dave has talked about um, multiple times throughout as we look at Scripture, there are kind of that, that triage. We have the, the things that we, that we say that we will die for. And, and so those things would be um, salvation. Uh, the inerrancy of Scripture. Um, those things are, are things that, that we have to hold with a, with a closed fist. Like, w- there's no argument, there's no discussion about, uh, about salvation is through Jesus Christ alone and his death and burial and resurrection, the inerrancy of Scripture. 
there are other things as we work our way out that we can discuss and we can debate, um, but it doesn't impact at the very core of, of who Christ is. And so we, we have to be careful as we go through Revelation that we don't get out into the weeds too far and allow those things to really um, impact the way, that we, the way that we interpret. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind as we, as we work through this. Um, another thing that we see in chapter 12, we see a lot in Scripture, uh, especially in Revelation, is there is a lot that references back to Old Testament imagery. And so as we're looking at some of this stuff, uh, for the first readers of this text, remember it was written to uh, the, the seven churches in Revelation, um, the first readers of this text would have have an understanding of Old Testament imagery, Old Testament uh, language. And so as they're reading this, it, it probably makes a lot more sense to them then than it does for us now. Uh, at the time that this was written, it was during uh, where Roman and Greek mythology was also very popular in the culture. And so John uses some of that same language to grab their attention, but then always brings that back to uh, the center of, of Jesus and, and the foundation of Scripture. So as we go through this, that's something that we need to keep in mind, that we have to be careful uh, when we start thinking about this, this dragon that we're going to talk about. Is it a physical dragon, or did, are these things literally happening? Um, I can say this. It's literally figurative. Okay, all right. So with that, let's talk about our characters here in this first section, because we need to identify this really sets the foundation of where we're going for the rest of, uh, the rest of today. So we're introduced in chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 6, we're introduced to uh, the woman, uh, a child, and a dragon. And so who are they? Who, who is this woman? Um, what does she represent? So one view, if uh, the Catholic Church would view this woman as Mary. Um, most scholars, though, as you look at and study this, most scholars agree that based on the imagery, based on the context, uh, that this is not the case, that she more than likely is a representative of, at this time, of Israel, the righteous remnant, uh, the people of God, as we will see later on. Uh, Romans 11 would give support to that. Uh, there's also the reference to the sun, the moon, the stars. And if you think back just a few weeks ago, we were talking about Joseph and Joseph's dream. And we brought in that imagery of the sun, the moon, and the stars. That is, this is a, a tie back to that to represent the people of Israel, the chosen people of God, the line in which Jesus would come from. Verse 2 identifies that, that she was pregnant. Uh, she was in labor um, and, and um, agony. Uh, this points to the coming of the Messiah. Now, we know that through uh, biblical history that, that, the, uh, that the Jewish people, the people of Israel, they were, they were persecuted. And there was this, all this, this uh, prophetic language of a coming of a Messiah, the coming Savior. And so this, this labor and this agony um, is a picture of the coming of the Messiah, the look and the hope and the yearning for the Messiah to come. And we'll unpack that a little bit later. Then we see the dragon. So later on in Romans 12 and verse 9, it helps us to identify who, the, who or what this dragon is. And the dragon is, is Satan, is the enemy, the evil one. And we see quite a description of the dragon uh, it, it's given with seven heads and ten horns, and on each of the horn or each of the heads were crowns. And you can, this is one of those areas where you can get out and you can study and and read all the different pieces and parts of well, what this means and what does this number mean. And and there's there's this sense of um, uh, of completeness when we look at this, but it represents a great power and authority of the dragon. And so we get in an introduction in verse 4, but we're going to really be able to unpack later in, the, in this passage about, about the, the picture of this dragon. What we do need to see and what we do need to pay attention to, though, uh, in this section is that there is a desire for the dragon 
for Satan, for our enemy to devour the child. Well, who is this child? Most scholars would agree that this is speaking of of Jesus, and verse 5 would support that. She gave birth to a son, a male, who is going to rule all nations with an iron rod, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. This is the child. This is the son uh, that the dragon wants to devour. And if we understand that child as Jesus, we can look back in Scripture and we can see a storyline and how it plays out that the desire of the enemy is to devour, is to, um, is to get rid of this child. We look back in Exodus chapters 1 and 2, we see an order from Pharaoh to kill all the Hebrew baby boys. We see in Esther the story of how Haman has a desire to wipe out the nation of Israel. We see in the New Testament in Matthew 2 where Herod has a plan to find this baby that was born who is the coming king and to kill Jesus. There has been this plan since the beginning to get rid of the line, to get rid of uh, the coming Messiah. We see in verse 5 that the birth, uh, we see the purpose of the son. So she gave birth to a son, a male who is going to rule. It's the purpose, to rule all nations with an iron rod. And it says her child was caught up to God and to his throne. What is critical for us to understand is that that little small segment that said her child was caught up to God and to his throne The apocalyptic Christmas story and the ascension to heaven. That's the story of Scripture. That's the heart of God's plan, the coming of the Messiah and a conquering of death and returning to heaven. We'll talk more about that. Verse 6 tells us that the woman fled into the wilderness, a place of refuge, a place prepared by God to be nourished and cared for for that 1260 days. We're going to tie back into that later. Remember, these first six verses are really helping to lay a foundation of what is coming next as we continue to open that curtain a little bit more to see what's behind it. We see this uh, 1,260 days again. Last week, Dave covered, uh, he covered this, talked a little bit about this, but just as a, as a review, uh, we view this 1,260 days, the 42 months, the three and a half years, um, it really represents a period of time of persecution. Robert Mounts describes this time in his commentary in Revelation. He says, the temporal or the worldly designation of 42 months is also given in Revelation as 1260 days and a time, times, and half a time. Its primary reference is to the period of Jewish suffering under the Syrian despot of Antiochus Epiphanes in 167 to 164 BC. And it became a standard symbol for that limited period of time during which evil would be allowed free reign. It is the conventional period in apocalyptic literature for the temporary triumph of evil before the end of the age. So we're really talking about, as we look at this, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God to be nourished there for 1,260 days. During a time where evil seems to, have, uh, to be reigning, to be allowed to be free, this woman is able to be nourished and cared for, and we'll talk more about that. Daniel Aiken describes uh, that this place will be one of spiritual refuge. Uh, She may be persecuted and suffer, but she will also be provided for and sustained. And this is something that that we need to keep in mind. Persecution and suffer will happen, but there will be provision and there will be a sustenance given to survive. So we see in this first section a story of Christ's birth, his ascension to heaven. We begin to see the Christmas story from a little bit different perspective. You know, around Christmas time, we sing, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And it brings to mind pictures of Jesus wrapped in, in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. It's a calm scene, one of peace and celebration. And while that is certainly true, our text paints a different perspective or picture with a peek behind the curtain. We see that while 
Jesus and the birth of Jesus, and we celebrate that in, in the manger, there was more going on behind the scenes than what we realize, and that's what chapter 12 will help us to see. So what does all this mean for us as we look at verses 1 through 6 and we head into the rest of the chapter? It really comes down to this. Salvation has come. Salvation has come. And as we're going to see, this moment in verse 5 in which the Son was born and caught up to God was a declaration of victory. However, the enemy doesn't recognize it. And I came across this story that I thought helped really just to illustrate this picture of victory has been identified, victory has been, uh, been recognized by everyone except the enemy. And some of you may have heard this story before, uh, but August 15th, 1945, uh, Emperor Hiro, Hirohito of Japan addressed the nation for the first time by a radio broadcast. His message was simple and tragic for the Japanese. They had been defeated by the Allied forces. For many, the end of conflict came as a difficult but blessed relief. But for a small band of soldiers, the war was not over. Whether they, because they refused to believe what they heard or whatever the reasoning, a number of the Japanese soldiers continued fighting for years. The last of these was Lieutenant Hiro Onoda, who carried on fighting, he carried on hiding in the jungles until March 9th of 1974, 29 years after victory had been declared. He finally surrendered only after he received formal orders from his government. Jesus has decisively triumphed over our enemy. We see a picture of that in verses 1 through 6. The rest of the chapter is going to kind of expand that out for us to see how that happened. But Jesus decisively triumphed over our enemy. But we real, must realize that Satan hasn't gotten the memo quite yet. Hasn't recognized is going to continue on. Until there will be a definite time. And the rest of Revelation helps to unpack that. But the bottom line, what we need to remember, is that God is faithful to keep His promises and to protect His people. The second thing that we see as we look through uh, verses 7 through 12 is that Jesus conquers and we overcome. Jesus conquers and we overcome. The curtain opens a bit more and we begin to see a further picture or explanation of what we just read in verses 1 through 6, and war breaks out in heaven. Verse 7 says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon uh, and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail, and there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to earth and his angels with him. So the battling parties, who is battling here? Well, Michael and his angels. The archangel Michael, the one who fights on behalf of God's people. We see that as an example in the New Testament where Michael would fight on behalf of God's chosen people. He is given charge to fight against the dragon, against Satan and his angels. Well, an interesting point and something that we really should remember and, and understand is that, that Satan is not God's counterpart. He is not equal with God. And, and we see that in this because God is not the one fighting the dragon. Michael the archangel is charged with this fight and is successful, as we see in verse 8. Uh, some commentaries say that, that um, it's as if God recognizes that this fight is below him and he doesn't need to, he doesn't need to stoop down to fight this. He sends, his, he sends Michael out and gives him charge to fight. There is success in verse 8. It says, but he, the dragon, could not prevail. And there is no place for them in heaven any longer. As a result, verse 9 tells us that the dragon was thrown out. He was thrown to earth along with his angels. And so it's important that we recognize just how 
powerful God is. Sometimes we, we have the thoughts that come into our head like, why is evil so rampant in this world? And it is. And, and maybe you've already, you'll, you'll see why. And we think, why isn't God doing anything? This helps to open the, the picture and help us to see there are things that God is at work, but we also need to understand that evil will not conquer. God is powerful. Satan does not have the same power and strength as, as God does, and we can rest assured in that. So what are we seeing with this peak behind the curtain in the first part of uh, 7 through 12? Robert Mounts in his book cites a few authors that really helped to describe the scene so well. Uh, this this uh, author, uh, commentator, Caird, says, Michael's victory is simply the heavenly and symbolic counterpart of the earthly, earthly reality of the cross. Commentator Harrington says, The fall of the dragon is really the victory of Christ. Victory over Satan was won by Christ on the cross. Satan's defeat in battle is Paul's doctrine of justification by faith in pictorial form. The fact is, Jesus conquers. How is it that, that this dragon is thrown out? Yes, Michael, the arch, arch, archangel, is, is battling the dragon. At the same time, Christ is on the cross. And when Christ dies on the cross, is buried, resurrected, ascends to heaven... He hands Satan the defeat. Jesus conquers. But that's not all. Because Jesus conquers, we overcome. Verses 10 through 12 is this announcement. The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of, of His Christ have now come because the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown out. They conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives to the point of death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. Jesus conquers and we overcome. That's a great place for an amen. Jesus conquers and we overcome. The announcement has been made. Victory has been achieved defeat to the enemy in heaven, and he is finally and forever cut off from access to be the accuser before the throne. Satan has no more standing in heaven to go and to accuse God's followers. Do you see what it, what it says in verse 11? We overcome not because of our good works, we don't overcome because we have done something right or we say the right things. So how do they, the believers, how do we overcome? How do we conquer? Verse 11 says, uh, they conquered by the blood of the Lamb. Conquered by the blood of the Lamb. That is Christ's death on the cross. Him dying on the cross in our place. That is how we overcome. And by the word of their testimony. Now, this word of the testimony is not me saying, well, yes, Jesus died, but look at all the good things that I'm doing. Look at all the checklists that I've made. No, this word of the testimony is testifying to the fact that I did nothing. It was all Christ. It was all his work on the cross. So how do we overcome well, we overcome because of Jesus, because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, our testimony, testifying of the works of Christ on the cross. Remember that this letter, as I said earlier, was written to the seven churches that we studied last year in chapters 1 through 3. And each of these churches needed this encouragement to conquer. We had one church that was... That, that was seemingly doing everything right, but every other church had something that they needed to work on. But even when in life when things are going well and you feel like 
man, I'm just battling, I'm feeling some success. Don't you need that encouragement to, to keep on keeping on? That, that is what this letter was to these churches. One, if you're not, very bluntly, it was get your act together. This is what it's all about. It's not about you. It's about Jesus and what he did. He, you, that's the only reason we have any sort of victory is because of Christ's death on the cross. But if you're heading in the right direction, don't forget it's Christ, not you. They needed this encouragement. We need this encouragement. So for us today, is this message applicable? Absolutely. Death Satan was defeated with Christ's work on the cross. We read that in 9 and 10, or in 9 and 10, we see what is the purpose of Satan? It says, so the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who is called devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. And verse 10, as we read, it says, he is the accuser of our brothers and sisters. The purpose of Satan is to deceive, is to lie, to obscure the truth, and to accuse. Prior to Christ's death and ascension into heaven, the battle that we just read about, that we just saw, Satan was before God's throne accusing the believers. But at the moment of Christ's death on the cross and his ascension, Christ settled that. No more. The accuser The prosecutor had been removed from the courtroom and no longer has any case against us. Christ, our defender, has won our case. And what is this case? The case is we are charged with sin against a holy God. We are charged in living life our own way and not God's way. The Bible makes that clear that anything that is, is not done in, in a, a way that pleases God, anything that opposes God, is sin. Thoughts, words, actions. Romans 3.23 says, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. There's no one here in this room or watching online that is off the hook. If we believe that Scripture is true and how it's written, it says we have all sinned. That is, that is the case that we go into the courtroom with. That is what Jesus, our defense, is preparing to settle. At the point when this battle was settled, sin and anything less than perfect righteousness cannot be in the presence of God. And that's what Christ did on the cross. He died as the perfect, righteous one in our place. He told God, he told the judge, I will take the punishment for humankind and settle this once and for all. We read this, uh, how this plays out in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. It says, but God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, will we be saved through, uh, through him from wrath? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, But we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. Amen. Each of us have a choice. The debt has been paid. Our defense has come to the judge and said, I'm going to take this punishment. I'm going to provide this reconciliation to make things right. But it doesn't take effect until a decision is made. Until each of us have to make that choice of turning from going our way and turning towards God. And that is to recognize that your sin separates you from God. That the penalty on your own is eternal separation from God. But turning to God and placing your faith in the work on the cross... 
Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's as simple as that for us. As we see how it's been unpacked in Scripture, this was not a simple process. Our faith in Christ is recognizing everything that Christ has done on our behalf. A way has been made to have this relationship with Christ. If you have not ever placed your faith in Jesus as Savior, I encourage you to do so today. If you're online, you can connect with your host by clicking on the the tab that's going to show up in the chat window. If you're here, I would encourage you to to visit with one of our prayer team members, one of our ushers, one of our pastors. We would love to be able to share with you how to begin that relationship with Christ. If you have a relationship with Christ, though, listen to the verses in Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, through Christ who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers. Those are the things as the, as the curtain is beginning to open and we see that there is this battle going on in heaven. These things that we cannot see, that are not intended for us to see, but we know are happening, nor the angels, nor the rulers can't separate us, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We overcome because Christ conquered. We can have, in having a relationship with Christ, we can have that confidence. We don't have to fear. Yes, there is a battle going on. There are things that we can't explain in this world things that just are weird and can be terrifying. But we can have this confidence with a relationship in Christ. There is nothing that's going to be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is faithful to keep His promises and to protect His people. The third thing that we see is God provides in battle. Verses 13 through 17. It says, When the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to earth, he persecuted the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she could fly from the serpent's presence to her place in the wilderness where she was nourished for a time, times, and half a time. From this mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river flowing after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth helped the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river so that the dragon had, uh, so that uh, the river, let me start that again. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the river that the dragon had spewed from his mouth. So the dragon was furious with the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring those who keep the commands of God and hold firmly to the testimony of Jesus. Remember that victory has been declared. But as we're reminded in this section, Satan continues his efforts to deceive and accuse, and as we see, even step up efforts. We left off this last section in verse 12 where it said, Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you with great fury, because he knows his time is short. War has been settled in heaven. Satan has been thrown out of heaven, and it shifts now to earth. It's as if the attitude, and and maybe you've seen this in in movies you've watched, or 
um, maybe even in, in uh, sporting events, like in, in poor sporting events uh, or poor sportsmanship, it's, I know I have lost, I'm going to bring down as many people as I can with me. That's, that really is the attitude that we're looking here. Defeat has been declared. Satan knows his time is short. And so his goal is to take down as many as he can. The woman is persecuted. Uh, some scholars will continue to say this represents Israel and the faithful remnant. Um, others say that based on the unfolding of the events, and, and as we see, it's like each of these sections give just a little bit more detail, a little bit more of opening that curtain up to see what's going on behind the scenes. But others will say that based on the unfolding of events, this is more likely a representation of all believers, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, Robert Mount's uh, commentator says, It is out of faithful Israel that the Messiah will come. So that's what we had read earlier on in, in 1 through 6. It should cause no trouble that within the same chapter, the woman comes to signify the church in verse 17. The people of God are one throughout all redemptive history. The early church did not view itself as discontinuous with faithful Israel. We see now a reference, a bit more detail behind the curtain in verse 14. So before we, we get there, we see this picture of a shifting of recognizing that the woman in verses 1 through 6 is this picture of Israel, this faithful remnant, the line in which the Messiah will come. And as we, as we move our way through this chapter, we see it to signify more of a picture of the church. We see that in verse 14, there is a, 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 that place of refuge. We're, we're going back to uh, maybe a little bit further explanation of what we had read earlier in the first section. So the woman was given two wings of, of, of a great eagle so that she could fly from the serpent's presence to her place in the wilderness where she was nourished for a time, times, and half a time. So there's been a lot of discussion. What are these two wings of a great eagle? Uh, some scholars will say it's, it's a picture of Egypt and Babylon. Uh, others will say it was, it was two ends, the east and west of the Roman Empire. Or more current, uh, some scholars will say it's a strong military power currently that has a mighty plane to fly in on a rescue mission. When I read those, I go, I don't know. But what I do know is what it is, the bigger picture of what it's talking about, is there's a place of wilderness. Um, we sometimes think of wilderness as the middle of the desert. We think, where is the refuge in that? <laughs> this picture of wilderness is a refuge, a place where um, there's nourishment, there is protection. Verses uh, 14 through 16, there are references to imagery and events of the Old Testament um, that readers at this time would have been familiar with. Uh, Daniel Aiken gives some insights into this uh, picture of the wings. Uh, wings often appear in the Bible as a sign of God's protection. And so is it something physically, a big bird comes in, or is it uh, you know, a mighty military power? I don't know. And sometimes when we read through Scripture, we have to be okay with saying, I don't know. By faith, I'm going to take it, but what is the bigger picture? The bigger picture is it is a picture of uh, God's protection. The woman will be protected. The church will be protected. Uh, later on, we see this picture of water, a flood. Um, it's an indication of the desire of the enemy of the dragon to destroy the woman, to destroy the church. Exodus 15, 12 reminds us, um, it says the earth had helped the woman. Exodus 15, 12 says you stretched out your hand and the earth swallowed them. And there's stories of that. And again, remember we're talking about 
picking up Old Testament pictures to prove a point as the churches are reading this that protection is coming, protection is available. And so I think it's important as we look at at this section of passages not to try and figure out exactly what the imagery means, but to see that bigger picture of God's provision and God's protection. And so now we come to verse 17. So the dragon was furious with the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring. And then it identifies who are the rest of her offspring? Those who keep the commands of God and hold firmly to the testimony about Jesus. So as we follow this through, since Satan cannot destroy the church as a whole, he moves on to individuals. As far as strategy and battle, isolate, pick one off at a time, and eventually the hope is that all that the whole will fall because of the individuals. That's the plan of attack of the enemy. We know why. Because he's furious. He's lost. His time is short. And we know when. Honestly, we can look at our culture and say, uh, is there ever been another time where the church is under such attack and individual Christians are under attack? Now, we can say here in the West, it's, it is relatively comfortable We start looking at pictures of what's going on in the world and how Christians are under attack, how the church is under attack, and we can say there's evidence of these things happening right now. We know even just what we've experienced over these last five years, and and we can probably point back even further of, of the faith that we have in Christ is more and more under attack. It is less and less popular to be a Christian. Not that we ever needed to do it because it was popular, but it is less popular. It is not as well accepted. We are in really in the thick of it, regardless of your interpretation of Revelation. Believers are under attack. We've seen behind the curtain why there are difficulties for believers today. Because Satan knows his time is short, he's doubling down. We see throughout Scripture that there will be difficult times and trials and persecutions. We are not exempt from that. But God provides what is necessary for battle. Faith and trust in Him that we are saved and our enemy has already been defeated. This is a prime example of why we need each other. Why we need the church. Why it is important to be here on Sunday mornings in the worship service. Why it is important to be involved with small groups, with our grace groups, involved with Bible study. These are not things just to check off the list to say, I I went to church today, I'm part of a small group, I'm, I'm, I'm part of a Bible study. We need to see that that what God has provided us to be successful in battle, to overcome. He has given us each other. We are stronger together with Christ at the center. As believers, that's why we have the church. We have the church to support one another, to worship God, to connect with one another, because these battles that we are facing, we cannot do on our own. We need support from one another. We need to recognize as a collective group that it is all because of what Jesus did on the cross and our testimony to that. God is faithful to keep His promises and protect His people. Just like the lieutenant who didn't want to accept the message that the war was over, that defeat had been handed down, so is the same with Satan. But as we continue our study in Revelation, we will see there is a definitive end. And we can rest in Christ's work, knowing that salvation has come. Jesus conquered, and we have overcome. And that God will provide in times of battle. As the worship team comes forward, would you uh, pray with me? Let's pray. Father, we are... So grateful uh, that your word is true, 
Lord, that you sent Jesus as salvation. Lord, that it was um, your plan all along to provide a way out, a way of, of hope and security and a relationship with you. Lord, we thank you that Jesus has conquered and that because of that, we can overcome. Thank you for giving us the tools that we need to battle. That We don't have to do this on our own. In fact, we can't do it on our own. We acknowledge that. Lord, we need you. We need each other. Lord, I pray that uh, we would find that encouragement today. That we don't have to fear because you are with us. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our worship time together.
and I will rise when he calls my name no more sorrow no more pain I will rise on eagles wings before Yes, you are mighty to save. 
Amen. He conquered the grave. And we can rest in that, that uh, defeat has been handed down. We have been given the tools to be able to move forward in battle. Yes, time, life will be difficult. We're going to face difficulties, but our enemy has been defeated, and we can praise God for that. Uh, Thank you for being here today. Don't forget to go down and enjoy some coffee and cookies, and you are dismissed. Know that you are loved. On the inside, already so heavy, weighing on my soul. All the fear, all the worry, all the heartache, all the hurting, colliding with your lighting, trying to steal my hope. Some days I break, I lose my way, more doubt than faith. But every time I'm in the fight, your love keeps pulling me back, pulling me back, it's magnetic. Won't give up on me. It's a fountain flowing so deep. You're so patient and so gracious. It's unconditional. Even when I try to go my own way, even when my heart is in the wrong place, you bring it back around like a boomerang, just like a boomerang. Just every time I'm in the fight, your love keeps pulling me back, pulling me back. It's magnetic. There's no one to